Uh, welcome to Pro Tips, How Comics Get Reviewed. My name is Johanna Draper Carlson. I run ComicsWorthReading.com, uh, which is celebrating its 14th year this year. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, from the far end, we have with us Douglas Wolk, who writes about comics for the New York Times Book Review, the Los Angeles Times, Comics Alliance, and elsewhere. We have Dan Coyce, culture editor at Slate.com, who has also written for the New York Times and Publishers Weekly. We have Michael Kavna, who is a columnist, cartoonist, and graphic novel reviewer with the Washington Post. Heidi McDonald, who runs Comics Beat and is also comics review editor for Publishers Weekly. And Bridget Alverson, who writes for Robot 6 at Comic Book Resources and the School Library Journal, among other sources. So, let's start with some basics. What are the two things you wish people who submit comics to you would do? Or what are the two pieces of advice you would give somebody who wants to submit a comic? I can answer this one. <laughs> Tell us when the release date of your book is <laughs> oh, yeah. and make sure it is the release date. If you have the option of going optimistic or pessimistic, go with pessimistic. And then like add a month. Yeah. 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 But don't say like, oh, you know, it's going to be out in April, but it's going to be out September of next year. This has happened to me. <laughs> Now, you know, Douglas, you told me that story a while ago, and, you know, I don't want to name the publisher, but, I mean, you would marvel at who it is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Nicely done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Heidi, your pieces of advice? Uh, yeah, oh, uh, well, send out a review copy. Um, uh, you know, don't send too much information. Also, I mean, you know, we're all busy. We get a million things, and um, so you know, if you you send a thing, if you send it in a, uh, I I've done this panel before, and I always say, you know, if you send it in a folder, and in the folder there's a, a CD-ROM, and then there's a book, and then there's a paper clip, and then there's a little binder clip of things, and you know, actually, kind of the more you send, the more it looks more work it's going to be for me, and I might just say, oh, I'll get to that later, and set it aside. So you know, just the book with a nice little PR release. Um, also, um, I mean, for different size publishers, uh, might have different. Don't use NetGalley or Adawise, and uh, that is kind of mean to say because I know that they both rely on publishers using them. But at Publishers Weekly specifically, we do not use NetGalley or Adawise. I don't know. Does anybody know what those are here? Yeah. Okay. So a few people. They are basically services which make e-galleys available. Um, however, they are in the proprietary Adobe format, so you can't, like if I download it as the editor of the review section, I can't just forward it to somebody, uh, you know, they won't be able to open it, so that person has to go on, because our reviews are an anonymous, uh, it compromises the anonymity. So we don't use NetGalley, we don't use Analyze, and we also, you know, they're just, uh, I mean, you know, I I'll talk more about other, uh, you know, how the proper way to do it, but uh, I don't really like those services, so. Um, can I add on to that? Yeah. Um, I both write reviews and I assign reviews at my blog, Good Comics for Kids. And anybody who sends me PDFs makes my life really easy because then I have a private Dropbox for my reviewer and I can upload the PDFs. I have a list of priority uh, reviews, things that I want reviewed. And so it makes ver it very easy for my reviewers to just grab them and go. And the other thing that I would say, two things with which are sort of organizational things, if you're a publisher, please have a catalog page for each book that I can link to in the review. Don't make me link to Amazon, please. And also, it's helpful because that catalog page usually has that information that I need, such as the release date. And the other thing is, um, and this happens kind of a lot, 
like I I'll be at a show and I'll be talking to a marketing person and I'll say, you know, can I be on your review list? And they're like, yeah, sure. You know, and I, and I don't really care, digital or hard copy. I'm usually pretty easy that way. But then like nobody ever follows up. And so, and I'm busy. I have a lot of re review copies coming in. So it's, if, if you're really interested in, in making sure your books get reviewed by one of my sites, you might want to like contact me directly or follow up with, you know, the marketing guy and say, hey, is she on your list? And I would say, get on our radar early. What I get a lot is like, hey, this book's coming out next week. Can we get, can we get a review? Can we get this? Or you want to talk? And it's like, especially this time of year, you know, we just came off National Book Festival. We have this, we have, it's, this is, is everyone, everyone wants reviews leading up to the holiday shopping season. And it's this crush. And I literally have a fort around my desk. And if there are ever layoffs, I'm not leaving because they won't find me. <laughs> it is, I mean, it's not just Chris Ware building stories. It's, it's so, you know, one person I'll cite, like, uh, first, second, just as in Gene Yang, what I love, beginning of the year, hey, Gene's got this coming up, and, and he's Gene Yang, so, you know, it's different, but still, early in the year, this is coming up, and then a few months later, and it stays on your radar, and, you know, there's a rule of three, not just in comedy, but in public relations, and, like, if I hear about, I remember, like, when Matt Boers first got on my radar, it's like he was doing, doing political cartoons, and all of a sudden he was doing comics journalism, and all of a sudden he was coordinating other people's work and was part of terror. And it's one thing I would say is a do as opposed to a don't is if you really have someone you, know, you want to put out there, let me know when they're coming to town or uh, all the time I have publishers who they'll tell me this creator's doing one thing and they're doing three other things and they don't mention it. And I really appreciate it. Someone recently said, yeah, you know, he's doing this book for us, but he's got this coming up, and I'm like, okay, this creator's going to be in the news a lot. So don't just be so proprietary about what, you know, your imprint, just because you have this. Like Paul Pope has several things coming up. Let me know, and, uh, you know, there's a better chance I'll cover everything he's doing. Uh, the, that's all really good advice that everyone just gave. I hope everyone listened to it. Um, the two pieces of a of the two suggestions that I would make are, um, first of all, to, to think about the places that you are submitting to and to think about how your work might fit there. Um, and sometimes that means doing some extra legwork to read the, the publication that you're submitting to, to think about how they um, write about comics, how they cover comics, and how they use comics. You know, sending to someone like Doug is a different, there's a different strategy there than sending to someone like Michael the Washington Post. and and Michael at the Washington Post cover comics in a different way than PW does, and, and Slate covers comics in a different way than all of them do. And so the more you can familiarize yourself with a publication, the more you can, you can focus your pitch to them and make them see in the first few sentences of that email or that press release, oh, not, this person is thinking of how this work could be really interesting to me specifically. Maybe you know my taste. Maybe you know what Slate's taste is. Maybe you know that we, you know, that we hire an illustrator every month to illustrate our books coverage, and that is always someone who has a book coming out. Um, and if you can focus that, that makes us, A, it makes our jobs easier, but B, it also makes us really love you because it means that even if you only did it for five minutes to pretend like you read us, you at least are pretending like you read us, which is like so much more than most people even bother to do. Um, and then the other suggestion I would make is, a lot of these suggestions I think are really useful and good for for publishers, right, who have something in their budget for review copies, who expect that they're gonna be sending out physical copies of books to people who are jerks like me and who are bad at reading PDFs and always want physical copies. But that's not always an option or financially feasible for independent creators who are publishing their own stuff. And we understand that and we get that. And it's very rare, I think, that an editor is going to demand that an independent creator send them, you know, FedEx them a physical copy of the book the next day air for the next day. Um, and so I would just urge you, if you're an independent creator who doesn't have the infrastructure of a publisher behind you, who really wants to get your stuff into people's hands, to, um, to use events like this as a way to reach out to people who you think might be there. And so, for example, if you have gotten the sense for the last three years that I am at SPX every year, and Slate is a place where you would really like to see your work covered or talked about or written about, 
um, email me in the week before SPX and tell me, hey, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be at this booth. Come find me, and I will come find you, and I will look at your stuff, and I will buy a copy of your book from you if I think it looks interesting. And I think that's true of almost everyone here. You know, if, if we know, if someone reaches out to us before a show and really you know, personalizes that pitch, we're going to make a point to try and find them because we, we want people who want, to, who want to be featured in our magazine. Yeah. And I would add to that, the, you know, like Raina was talking earlier about you have to cartoon, you have to, and Jules Pfeiffer said he does it for his sanity, you know, to try to maintain it. You know, I, SPX, like I remember walking by Nate Powell's booth, like, I don't know, five years ago or whenever Swallow Me Whole came out. I'm like, you are so good and I so want to catch up to you and I have so much going on and I can't, but keep, bother you're so talented and I went to his booth, but just keep bothering me. And when March came out, I felt like everything came together. And I guess there, for all of us, I would say there, there are always people on our radar. I mean, hundreds of cartoons, thousands. And you know, we can't, maybe we can't get to you even this year, but last year, you know, a couple of years later, I'm doing a, a panel with Nate. And it's just like, it comes together. Keep, keep it, just because you don't hear from us or it's short, don't know you, we're not, you're, you're registering, just keep after us, if that makes sense, because there's just so much good stuff out there, which is a good thing. Yeah. And I would add, to cover the basics, cover the basics. I have gotten press releases with no title in the first paragraph. <laughs> now, admittedly, that was a company that has since mostly gone out of business. But, you know, make sure we have the basics. Your name, the artist's name, the book title, the release date like we're talking about, where you find it. As Dan said, read the site. My site has submission guidelines. One of the first things it says is I don't cover horror comics. Would you like to guess how many horror comic submissions I get? A <laughs> hundred. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I think I keep sending them to you too, don't I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, and the most important thing is be professional. Be polite. You know, we, uh, we want to cover this stuff. Now, some of the stuff we're talking about is from um, a glut of too much good fortune so you might want to find smaller sites, especially if there are niche sites that suit what you're doing, and submit to them. And when you email a bigger site or a better known site, you can always say, and here's another review of my work that appeared recently, which is always interesting to me anyway, to see what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. Some of you talked about e-galleys and the net galley service and things like that. Have you found that problematic in dealing with comics? I'm thinking, for instance, of a company that put out a 3D blue and red printed comic that sent out PDFs <laughs> you know, without glasses. They, well, they later yeah. figured that out. But you know, I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, sometimes you definitely need to see the whole book. You know, mm -hmm. like that book. Uh, I, I know the one you're talking about, and that wasn't as successful as an Ealy. You know, Anomaly is this book that came out of the little coffee table of a book, and um, so they sent us. You know, and it was an expensive book, and they sent us uh, two copies. So you know, take that. You know who, but um, uh, no, I mean I it's just it's just going that way, and I mean I used to uh, fear PDFs because um, you know I I'm like Michael, uh, I have you know physical books stacked up and can't find anything, and I was like, how on earth will I find a little PDF? And then as publishers got more into it, they became more organized, which helped me be able to organize them, and so you know I just I just make a folder. It's called October Books, and I just <laughs> put the PDF in there. It's so simple. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I you know who does that, and I mean, I'm sympathetic to watermarks. I think that you putting a water, a subtle, readable watermark, on it is fine, and I understand the worries about piracy and all that. I mean, obviously, I like to think that anyone I hire at Publishers Weekly, which includes everyone on this panel except Michael, <laughs> actually, at one time or another, um, you know, they have the integrity <laughs> not to put this up. Uh, to share it, you know, so, uh, you know, that is less of a fear. I would like to just um, actually talk about, for, for Publishers Weekly specifically, because we have a couple of tools, it's going to sound a little, you know, sales pitchy, but I, I actually think the tools that we have now are really, really, really good. 
for publishers and self-publishers especially. So for publishers, we now have a system called Galley Tracker. And you can, uh, you know, I don't have the URL, but if you Google Galley Tracker and Publishers, I think it's publishersweekly.com slash Galley Tracker, pretty sure. Uh, you as a publisher can just upload your PDFs directly through the system. You put in all the information, and when you tag it as a comic, it will come directly to me. I will go onto this, this little nice grid system I see, and the, the galley will be right in there. I will immediately uh, accept or reject it. You know, I do it about once a week where I go through there and assign it for review, and you can see where the galley is going. And I'm training all the publishers, uh, except Marvel and DC, because they won't do it, um, to use these. And it's, it's awesome, you know? Again, it's very organized, I'll find it, and it goes right to the reviewer, and it's a really great way, and any publisher can use this, any publisher, no matter how big or how small. Now, if you are a self-publisher, we have another tool, which is called PW Select. And uh, interestingly, this is for self-published authors. And interestingly, I've had to explain to everyone at Publishers Weekly that in comics, self-publishing is incredibly well established. There's no stigma whatsoever attached to it. And you know, it is a hallowed tradition. So, and, you know, I, I reviewed Matt Bohr's work, a book that came out that was kickstarted. I mean, I've done it, and then there was a little bit of like, hmm, well, where did this come from? I'm like, well, you know, we need to address this. We need to address crowdfunding and whether we're going to review these books. So if you, have, or if you are a self-publisher, you can go to PW Select, and again, you can submit your book for review. And it will be considered, there's a screening committee um, that will go through it. But they have found that the comic submissions for the PW Select are actually a little higher quality <laughs> than some of the other books. I think it is because of the, the strong tradition. But uh, you know, I would really urge anyone, there, we used to charge for PW Select, but now we have a free portal for it. And I would really urge anyone to use Galley Tracker or PW Select to be reviewed in Publishers Weekly uh, because you know it is a very, it is very influential in the book trade. So, and, and we have these tools, so you can do that. So anyway, that's my sales pitch, but I think they're good tools. I would back that up. If you are not familiar with the way Publishers Weekly works, it is, I mean, getting a review in Publishers Weekly will get you in bookstores. It will get other bigger publications paying attention to you. I mean, that just getting reviewed at all is a real, it's a real boon for a book. And PW makes it real easy now. But that only applies to books, not comic issues, correct? Yes, yeah. that's correct. But okay. you know, like uh, maybe someone else can talk here, but you know, like one other thing you really need is an e ISBN number, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so what determines what you decide to cover? What gets your attention? Since we're talking about having too much to handle. Uh, I'll start with that. So uh, there are sort of, there's two fronts in which a book can get covered in some way in Slate. Um, one is simply if it's just a book that I assign out or assign myself uh, uh, a review of. You know, I, I look at it, it seems, it's interesting, it's a creator who I've liked, it seems big or smart or surprising, um, or I look at it and I immediately think, oh, I happen to know someone who would write a great interesting piece about this, um, and I assign it out. And that, you know, that is, we, the Slate books coverage is about 10 to 15 pieces a month. Um, and I would say over the course of a year, probably I sign out five or six um, comics for standard review. But then uh, we also have an additional way that I get comics in the magazine, which is that every month we have uh, an illustrator who um, is someone who has a book coming out who I hire, if it's a paid gig, um, I would describe it as almost embarrassingly poorly paid, but not quite. Um, but it's a paid gig where a uh, cartoonist illustrates eight pieces uh, in the book review each month, and we feature the book, we pay the cartoonist some money, um, and we tweet it like crazy and sell books. And, um, and that is usually the route that um, less established uh, cartoonists get into the magazine by. It is a way that small press books get, uh, and self-published books get, handled a lot. Um, individual issues get covered that way um, from big, you know, from big uh, houses and small. 
Um, and people seem to have really enjoyed it as, I mean, as a paid gig, it seems like a not a, that onerous of a gig, uh, you know, good, really good cartoonists do it and seem to like it, and it seems to sell books. And, and I mean, I would say in general, when an offer like that comes your way, where people want to pay you money to illustrate something, um, even if the money is not as much as you might wish it was, it, you know, measure that opportunity carefully because sometimes those are worth it. The cartoonists that have done that for Slate, I think, have sold books and have also gotten picked up for other illustration jobs at Slate and elsewhere on the strength of those pieces. Um, and I think those th that's usually a, a good opportunity. So what I'm looking for for those for those opportunities specifically is someone who has a book with a really distinctive and sharp and great visual style, someone who uses color really well because I'm going to be looking for that for illustration, uh, even if it's not readily apparent from the book. For example, Sam Alden did our illustrations earlier this summer, and it was not immediately apparent from his book that he could do color very well as they were all nothing but pencil. Um, but I could go to his website and see, oh, this is a guy who obviously made a stylistic choice and knows and can use color and has a wealth of stylistic options at hand. Um, and all those people are people who, you know, either through SBX and meeting me there or through publishers who are willing to send books and, and let me see, you know, someone with a really vivid visual style. Um, they let me see that they were good for that. And I would add, too, one way to look at this panel is thinking of it as pro tips, ways to get noticed. Because I think, you know, I, I start cartooning professionally when I was 12, and fortunately, there's a kid in my class who's like, hey, I'll make copies of your mini comics, and I'll go to my dad's work, and I'll make copies, and I'll sell them, and I'll set the price. And it was sort of foretelling the way the business works. He never told me how many copies he sold. He just <laughs> said, here's your cut. <laughs> like, okay. But it, creatives and business, there's very few people who can do this. And I, between the way I work as a creative and the way that uh, when I deal with indie creators self-publishing, often I feel like they're not on top of it. And I would say if you're self-publishing, hire somebody, get an agent, somebody, and I'm used, and then you're not the bad guy. Occasionally I'll get emails like, hey, what do you think of my book? We could, what do you think of my book? What do you think of my book? Well, you know, then I, let, let, your, you let your agent or somebody else do that for you and don't worry about that. But, you know, one thing I would say is, comics, notice it's about community, as you've noticed here, that it's, it's, it's amazing how, what a small community it is. And if it, find a, a way to make noise. And if you can do it in multiple ways, it'll help anything you do get noticed. And in that way, you can build up to it. And it's amazing watching it at, at SPX. As we've seen from creator after creator, you, you come upon them here doing a mini comic. Then a couple years later, you see them doing something a little bigger. And suddenly, like Raina earlier, suddenly they've got a bestseller, and you you watch that progression, and they were you're either making the rounds, plugged into a community, it's it's you can do it. A cartoonist, I think, by nature are 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 loners, and most of them say control freaks, but a part of you you got to find a way to to be out there in some way, unless you're just like savant genius, and that's a whole different thing. If you are cold, and another thought, if you are cold submitting, include a link to your website or sample pages. These are comics, these are a visual medium. I sometimes get people emailing me about a book that says, my book is about X, well that's helpful, and I have no idea what it looks like. Make it easy, Th I think that's the, the main message, make it easy for us. Yeah. <laughs> so. We're really super lazy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, and, and, and kind of coming off of that, um, I'm pretty sure we're all a little bit like this, that like I'm always super focused on a project and then I turn that in and I'm like, oh God, now I have to do the roundup of 12 graphic novels for spring. And at that point I send out a flurry of emails because I already know what's in my head. I send out a flurry of emails to people going, can you get me PDF of this like now? And if you can turn that around quickly for me, I mean, I do a lot of roundups and mentions and we're all coming to the end of the year where people are gonna ask us for our top 10 or our top 100 or whatever. And having the books at hand um, makes a huge difference. There are certain publishers who um, maintain sites where they have like review copies and also downloadable previews of all their books. And honestly, they get covered more because when I have a whole, I have nothing to publish in Good Comics for Kids, I'll just like go over to Boom Studios and grab a preview of one of their books. And they're good, so I, I mean, I don't mind doing it. So 
sometimes being able to do that quick response, um, I mean, we're very grateful when you do it, but uh, we're always kind of, I'm always certainly always working on kind of a just on time uh, basis and being able to get the books when I need them is a big help. So uh, I have a question actually for everyone following up on Michael's uh, thought. Um, I, would everyone else on the panel suggest that people hire publicists? Is that? No. Is no. no. Not if they're bad. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. We should. You should also not, shouldn't hire a bad yeah, contractor. Do not hire a bad publicist. No. But you know, I've seen more publicists getting into the business actually, and um, you know, a publicist is someone who will nag, nag me, for instance. And if I look on my phone, there's actually a publicist who's been texting and calling me about a certain thing, and you know, I am going to do that. Uh, but, you know, he got paid. He got paid to nag me mm -hmm. and to make sure that I did that. And uh, so I think, you know, for me, we all talk about discoverability. And, you know, I'm sure we all get scads and scads of material. And, you know, coming here to S SPX, I mean, I had a certain amount of time to look, see what I was really interested in and who was here that I really wanted to get their new book. But, you know, it's very overwhelming. I mean, it's overwhelming for me, and this is, you know, what I do for a living. So, um, I mean, I go by trusted names first off. You know, I'm sure we all do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there's a publisher that I know does good work, I will always look at their books, you know, because we've built a trust relationship there. And there's so many small, great small presses here, you know, like Uncivilized and Secret Acres and Koyama and, and you know, like so many good things, you know, like spark plug. I mean, I just know they publish good books and I'm always going to pay attention to that. So if you're not, you know, if you're more uh, unaligned uh, than that, I mean, it is more of a struggle for me to know that I want to pay attention to your book. So um, the problem yeah. I've found with working with, there are some publicists that seem to be working with individual artists and to me that would be a negative because there's a lot of crap out there. And I'm not gonna know if I open an email from this publicist if it's the one good one or the five crappy books that they will ignore my request to take me off their mailing list for. Well, I So you have to be careful who you're associating with. I, I, think, I think too, I mean there's publicists and there's publicists, which is my, my I mean I've had publicists that I'll, I'll never do anything with again. Um, and then there are people who, who simply send me a lot of press releases. And then there are people who know what I write and who will, who will contact me and say, I think you'll be interested in this book. And I think that's sort of like, if you just are hiring someone who's gonna send out stuff to, to every person on their mailing list, yeah, you could do that. Um, but someone who's, who's willing to spend a little time hand selling a book to one of us in the middle of our busy lives, which doesn't have to, you know, you don't have to whine and dine us, really just send us an email that indicates you know who we are. Um, I think that that is definitely a plus. And you can rep your own book better than a generic publicist of the kind Bridget is talking about yeah. because you have passion for it mm -hmm. and you care. So I think another tip would be 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 true. If you're your creator, you're trying to tell any any genre, any medium, you're trying to tell a true story. You're trying to relate. If you're doing your own publicity, do the same in your materials because there's so much hyperbole, there's so many there's so much overstating this is the best thing I've ever done, and this is the greatest fan. And you immediately, like, we flinch. It's it's like, you know, seeing a car accident in the side of the road. You just know it's gonna be bad the closer you get to it. And just be be true. Have a focused, honed re release pitch, and, and but be true. And that, if I if I get an approach, like, it's like meeting someone at a party. If someone comes in, hey, I heard this about you, and you're there, and you're a friend, and I know your second cousin, and, and you feel it, and it's like, it feels like a, co come on. I mean, because this is, it's sort of a, a publicity for this is with your book, it's like a blind date if, if we haven't heard of you. Mm -hmm. And you immediately, you know, they say about speed dating because you know within a minute like how you feel about something. <laughs> it's just think about like speed publicity, you know? You make an impression in 60 seconds and we'll kind of flip, we're like, oh, they're kind of a cool, interesting thing. Or like, you know, he's thinking about restraining orders when there've been some, <laughs> so, and there are some bad publicists, you almost, publicists, you almost want to file a restraining order against. So. Well, and have a pitch. Know who you're selling to. You are not selling to everybody who reads comics. You know, you've got some subset of that you need to be targeting. 
And it's better to miss out on an opportunity than to try and target the wrong opportunity, I think. So. Okay, shall we open it up for a few questions? Do we have questions? There's one. There's, yes, sir. <laughs> The link. link. Yeah, as yeah. long as the link works, you know. <laughs> and, and, and isn't going to fill my computer with, yeah. but I with mean, spam. But, uh, don't, don't do, listen, don't do like the Dropbox or the, you know, the one that expires in five days. Yeah, the 48 hour Dropbox. Oh, yeah. A lot of times it'll, you know, be like a month later. I'm like, oh crap, I got to get that, you know. And then it's like, oh darn. So yeah, just, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I don't think there's any person on here that is pirating your PDFs, you know? I mean, I hope not, I really hope not. <laughs> but, um, you know, you have to have a little trust. And I, you know, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't mind a little watermark, just don't make it a big watermark. Um, yeah. Has there ever been a case of a comment letter pirated before it's been in spam? Ever? No. Somebody, somebody was pulling the Marvels the same day of release a couple of years ago, but yeah. that's not relevant to this crowd. Yeah. And, and look, don't worry about letting go, okay? I had a guy once submit to me who was so concerned about what I was gonna do with the copy after I get it. I don't keep everything, I'm sorry, I can't. Some go to the library, some go to resale used shops because they're like kittens, they should go find a good home. But if, it, if it's gonna bother you about, if you're gonna obsess over, oh, someone's gonna pirate my PDF, just don't do it. Find another way because it's not worth the hassle. You know, um, I just, I, I know you have more questions. I just wanted to, uh, what you were talking about, you know, with the pitch email and all that sort of thing. It's like, I, when you send me an email that says, I really want you to look at my comic that is about werewolves who are uh, on a planet, uh, you know, I just know. <laughs> I just know I'm not gonna like that comic. You know, I mean, I get so many of these Shit. pitches. <laughs> I just wrote that comic. And, I call them Artist Alley comics, okay? Like, I see a lot of people, no offense, I'm not, I'm just trying to be honest with you guys, okay? And I, you all know what I'm talking about, right? This you know? Is, this and is your I'm episode of Straight Talk with Heidi yeah. McDonald. Yeah, this is Straight Talk. And that's fine, I'm really happy you're doing this book, okay? And I will try to give it some of my attention, just to see if, you know, there's something there that sparks my interest or, um, but it's hard for me. You know, I definitely need, uh, I, I need more to go on than that. And if you know, anyone is writing a book about werewolves on a planet, I will read your book. <laughs> 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 but you may pirate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or find the werewolf fan site. Yeah. Yeah. Find the group of science fiction fans that love werewolf stories and pitch to them. I mean, come on, there's somebody out there for everybody. You know, the werewolves are fighting vampires. <laughs> oh God, I'm all in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> do we have another question? Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I, you know, comics have the, the beauty of being a visual medium, so after I hear that pitch, I can look at the cover that you attached or put a link to in their email, so, which, oh, by the way, if you do send an email, always, 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 always put art in there, because if it's not good enough to catch my interest, then you're really barking up the wrong tree to begin with, you know, but I mean, I'll look at the art, and I'll see if this is something that looks like it has potential, you know? And it's just, I, 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 you know, there's a lot of books that are passion projects of this one story that people want to tell. You know, I used to be an editor at Vertigo, and we had, you know, pitch day, where we had boxes and boxes of pitches. You know, we don't, we, they don't do that anymore because the lawyers clamp down on it. You're just not allowed to look at unsubmitted, sub, uns solicited submissions if you're you know on staff at a major comics company but we joked that if the first sentence of the pitch said this is about a war between angels and demons it went right back in the box you know and I mean if you've seen mm -hmm. and we got tons of them okay and so I'm just saying it's like you need to do something that is not generic you need to do something that shows that this is an individual book that has you know a spark to it I got one pitch that was you know, my comic about the horror of defaulting on student loans. And I thought, all right, 
I haven't seen that before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> this is a very cogent topic. And I went and I read this whole comic about student loan problems, and I made a big plug for it, you know, because it was interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was more interesting than the werewolves versus the vampires. <laughs> Um, also, if you're doing a comic of, that's a superhero comic that's different from all su other superhero comics, no, it's not. <laughs> um, I wrote a Kickstarter column for CBR for a while, and um, I would actually go on Kickstarter and just hit the comics tab and look at every project, and it just made me so tired. And I would think that one thing is maybe it, it's useful to go and take a look at that and see how people are, you know, revisiting the same tropes over and over and over again. And if you think your comic is going to fall into one of those categories, maybe think about doing something different. And I'll say, uh, last year, uh, as we were judging the Eisners a year ago, you know, you're in a room, and I assume you've done this with, with six, 7,000, 8,000 comics oh in there. God, yeah. And I remember, maybe in Frank Santoro goes, why do we have so many damn graphic memoirs here? <laughs> and it was like, but it, I will say, the Washington Post, like when I talked to some of the editors, there's a there's sort of a sucker quality to is it a true story or inspired by a true story and is mm -hmm. it, you know, it's the same thing, it's it's a journalism environment and it's the same thing and entices us while you find things on our homepage. Does it involve someone who is homeless or, or mentally ill? Does it have to do with race or gender or anything, you know, any of those sort of hot button things that, that you would find in a cloud is, or, or in a political speech? Um, something that, that, that just, tantalizes that or that feels of the now I know I'm speaking more for newspapers they're they're kind of suckers for it and so if you have a, a true a, a, a memoir that feels true and plus a lot of editors uh, you know we I've I've edited for years I've edited TV critics and film critics and some of them just want to they, they, they want to celebrate some work and they want to gnash they love to, to rip work I think most comics critics we're you know we're passionate about this. We 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 do this because we love comics. We we you know we 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 aren't paid enough to do this to just hate on comics. It's <laughs> not that thrilling, you know. And so as we as we're passionate about comics, you know it's it's the resonate true stories resonate. And and I'll just say journalists love they'll go oh like Mouse or or Persepolis and it's easy in newspapers to sell to those in the in a newsroom who don't get comics but they understand the the milestones you can say yeah that's like this but it's this um, so if that helps at all when you're pitching to newspapers um, yeah yeah but other critics if you're comparing yourself to mouse or persepolis you're setting the bar really <laughs> really high i would rather get kind of an f feeling and be pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. than hear somebody talk about how wonderful this is going to be and be disappointed so Yes. So from the perspective of a reader of writing, not necessarily a comic journal like us, how does one go about finding really good comic writing beyond just looking at the same thing in a slightly unique algorithm and, and going to the comics tab? We, we talk about sort of niche websites to sell we have comic writing, but how, how, what's the first step? How do I go about reading these things and finding the people that are really interested in work That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll put in a little plug for myself. I edit a, a daily column at Robot 6 called Comics AM. Mm -hmm. I don't link to a lot of reviews. I do link to a lot of creator interviews, though, and essays and commentary. And I really try to get a, a depth to it where, you know, I, I'll, if there's something in the New York Times, I'll always link to that. But also trying to get into those niche sites to provide. And so I would say the thing, too, is to look at sites that are that are kind of similar to that. Look at the blog role, obviously, which they probably haven't updated in five years. And, um, <laughs> but take a look at it anyway and, and, and follow, follow the links. And, and the other thing is, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, whatever the kids are using these days, <laughs> that's also a really good way. You find someone who's doing something interesting, you start following the people they're following. And, um, you know, I know my kids did it with LiveJournal, but I'm not sure that exists anymore. <laughs> Well, but Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook are great ways to find those things. Well, and you can also ask on those sites, too. I mean, you know, ask your friends. Yeah. Um, well, you, you lose a friend. Uh, you find that there's a project that's palpable for comic reviewing, and you're curious to see who's going to go down the Robert Sen title. This was a tentative thing, but for you, and you're sure that everyone will celebrate if the title can be articulated. Yeah, 
you know, there, uh, exactly. that's something that's a really good question because, again, uh, discoverability is such a huge issue now. And I'm actually, yeah, you're dead right. I have not updated my sidebar on my site, Comics Beat, for a long time. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we haven't. And, I mean, that is a project. I mean, I actually want to get an intern to help me do it because I feel like it's really important to have these updated resources. You know, there's a site that's, mm, see, now I'm forgetting the name of the, the, the site I was gonna, I think it's Panel Patter. Yes. And yeah. they mm -hmm. did like a ton of, of previews for SPX mm -hmm. and they have a really nice, like, I mean, I pay attention to what they do, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of a feeder site for me, really. Um, you know, Rob would you be so happy to hear you say that. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> he works really hard on it, you yeah. know? And I, I see yeah. that right away. You know, and a writer who used to work for me, uh, Steve Morris, he has his own site. He covers all kinds of uh, comic spire. You know, Zaina Bakhtar, uh, she's genius. I mean, she has a, her site's called Comics Cola. Now she's at Comics Alliance, and you know, that, like I, I have. You know, usually I try to get them to write for me. To be honest, like either for PW or for the Beat, because I want to, you know, bring them up to the next level. But I mean, does anybody else here have like a, a, a good feeder? You know, sites that they read. I mean, Rob Clo, he might mm -hmm. even be here in the room. I'm not sure how. Mm -hmm. But um, any other sites that you guys look at, or? Yeah, um, be because I do AM, I'm like linking off the link. So obviously the comics reporter, he has a random oh, yeah. comics yeah, news story. Also, Virgin if you like the more, like depending on the kind of thing that you like, um, but actually the Comics Journal blog always has links to reviews and interviews. And so those are, those are two that I use a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tom and the Daily Spurgeon Cartoonist. links to a lot of good. Yeah, yeah. Spurgeon does it reporters Reviews. locally. Comics DC does a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'd say too, um, in 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 seeking those out, like I've thought about in Twitter, just since we all read what by a factor hundreds of books that we never review or we don't even maybe represent, but we read so much, I've thought of just tweeting like, hey, reading this and this was a cool panel, and I, I, I don't know, maybe maybe I'll start doing that of just like linking to a book or here's a book that's coming out. And I really, instead of a full review, you might just have an impression. And that might just be enough to sort of get a, f a few people get it on their radar. Um, I don't know if that little interstitial stuff can, mm -hmm. can make a difference. I just started doing something called, I just call it shelfies, because literally books on my own bookshelf that came out th that I want to revisit. And sometimes I reach out to the creator. Uh, like I was talking to David Small, Stitches is one of my favorite graphic novels. And we're talking to them, and like I, I feel like certain books get lost, and you want to bring them back into, into sort of public awareness. But um, anyway, yeah, I just think through social media. I mean, would it help you, uh, either Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, to have little from critics, little sort of squibs, like instead of a full review, hey, reading this, this is kind of cool. It would help if I knew who all the critics were. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well. You know, I, I will uh, say that, you know, sometimes you do a lot of re reviews at the beat, but I am actually, like I did a Patreon campaign and the first goal was like setting up a really organized review section, which I'm actually in the process of doing. So, and I hope to like kind of up the level, you know, get some other people involved in it and really kind of make it a more of a portal for that kind of thing. Because I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think it's really important to, to, there's so much stuff out there and finding a trusted source mm -hmm. to find new stuff is, you know, is difficult sometimes. But well. the good news about the comics criticism world, the good and bad news about the comics criticism world is that it is extremely incestuous, which is to <laughs> say, if you find a writer who you like, like if you're like, oh, I like Doug Wolk, I like the way he writes about comics, um, you can Google him and you can find the like 15 different sites that Doug Wolk has written for, and many of them are probably also pretty good. You can then follow that trail to those different sites who see who else is writing for them, see who's good. I mean, there's a, the good news is that all of us have written for a lot of different places and, and a lot of those places are really good and, and you can then find people that way as well. I thought you were going to reveal our love child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the, that's the kicker of this. I think we have time for one more question. <laughs> this gentleman over here has oh. ha had his hand up very early. Yeah, okay. Uh-oh.
on the count of three. Okay, that's a really good question. But first, on the count of three, let's all yell, "Wake up!" One, two, yeah. three. Wake, wake up! up! Don't look at him though. <laughs> um, Don't look. So some of us have been comic creators in the past. Some of us are not. Some of us have started our own things, like Heidi has started her own thing. Some of us have just been employed by other people. Um, so I, I'm not going to hit that question, but I would definitely like a one-minute description of how Heidi founded the beat. Oh, well, that was uh, after I was an editor at Vertigo. Um, Rick Veach, the great cartoonist, Rick Veach, had a site called Comic-Con.com that he ran with Steve Conley, and they were looking for a writer, and I had gotten started writing for Comics Journal, so I started writing for that site, which is called The Pulse, and then I started a column called The Beat. And then I spun it off. It was, you know, the blog was invented in 2003. So, um, you know, I, I, I spun it off into a blog just because it seemed like the, the kind of thing that people should do. But and were you supporting income from that blog from other stuff initially, I mean, freelance stuff? Or how did you, like, at what point were you able well, to make a living they off that paid, blog? First, Rick paid me to do the blog. And then I went, took it to Publishers Weekly, and they paid me to do it. And then I... Publishers Weekly was sold, so I but I had owned all my content, which I'm a big believer in always mm -hmm. owning all your content. And I just did it on my own, and I sold advertising. I mean, it's not incredibly lucrative, but it's you know it does pay some money. So I mean, which is very hard. I would not advise anyone starting their own pop culture site right now on their own. I don't think that's possible anymore. So you know, can I ask one question of Douglas? Douglas. Yes. As the reviewer for the New York Times, so how do you pick? How do you get to pick a book to review for the New York Times? Um, I, we have a giant stack of books on my desk. I go through like use the ones that might potentially appeal to the Times other Times reviewers. Uh, most recent in the last few years, it's generally just been roundups. So a few times a year, they'll say we need a roundup for this date, and I'll say you know these are the eight things I'm considering. And Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, it was Jen McDonald before, but who is it now? Uh, that's actually a little bit in flux right now. I see. Yeah. yeah. All right. Ooh. Flux at the time. Yeah. At the times, comma. Yeah. Flux. A flux. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Careful how you spell that. Um, and I will say, like, with the post, uh, you know, we, the, I, I, I purposefully use the window of, of comic strips because comic strips get, I think at the post, six to eight million page views a month, comic strips. And so I pitched saying, well, I'll cover comic strips, but then I'll expand to graphic novels and uh, used it as a little sort of matrix window. And then they let me just sort of run free and it's my own playground. So uh, it's, but uh, but I found a way, you know, if, if, if you've kind of, if you've been at the pain of at the drawing board or at the editing board for, for hours, if you know what it's like to painfully live with a creation, it makes you so much more empathetic when you're gnashing at someone else's creation. <laughs> you know what it took. I, you know, I've, I've edited critics of, of every beat, you know, from dance to theater to, to film, and, and including local critics in the past, like Tom Shales, Lisa Demorais, you know, people who, and it's like, sometimes I want to say, yeah, it's a great point, but part of me was like, do you know how hard it is to do that? And so, sometimes before I sit down to any kind of review, I, I s remind myself, this is, this is, this is very difficult to, to get to this point. So that's sort of, you know, I, I, I come to it trying to convert people who aren't yet converted, I guess. I have one final piece of advice that has oddly has not been noted by anyone on this panel, I think, and it's so simple, but a shockingly huge number of people do not do it, which is if you have a Tumblr or a Twitter feed or a website or anything, any way that you want people to see your work and like you, please put your email address on that web presence. And I have a more basic one. If you have a <laughs> Tumblr, put your name on it. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know that it is cool and edgy to be anonymous on Tumblr, but if we are looking to, you know, hire you and hire pay you, you money, or or recommend you, like we need to know your name at some point. 
And oh, one other thing, you know, the next panel in this room is Robin Chapman talking about the Tiny Report, which is a book she does about uh, micro presses. And you know, she's another person who I read religiously to see what she's talking about. You know, mm -hmm. so I mean, she's doing some really great work. So I, I urge you to check out what Robin's doing as well. And that'll be it. Thanks very much to all of our panelists. <laughs>